The night Felix Moncla and Robert Wilson disappeared was calm and quiet over Lake Superior. A low-hanging cloud layer blocked the sun's dying light while scattered snow showers crisscrossed the frigid waters. It was cold, but then again every day was cold in the frozen forests of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Elsewhere in the world, however, tensions were heating up. It was November 23, 1953, six years after the start of the Cold War and in the very earliest days of the Civil Rights Movement. In spite of these brewing storms, it was an optimistic time for many in the United States. The economy was shooting through the roof. The baby boom was well underway and suburban life had never been more quaint. This was especially true for the 27-year-old First Lieutenant Felix Monqua, Jean to those who knew him, whose new wife had given birth to their first child, a daughter, only five months earlier. Maybe they were on his mind the night he vanished into thin air. The generally accepted version of the story goes like this. A couple hours after sunset on November 23, 1953, Air Defense Command ground intercept radar operators at Sault Ste. Marie, Michigan, identified an unknown radar signal over Lake Superior, around 160 miles northwest of Kinross Air Force Base. An F-89 Scorpion fighter jet was scrambled from the base at approximately 6.22 p.m. to intercept the unknown target. In the cockpit was First Lieutenant Gene Moncla, while Second Lieutenant Robert Wilson operated the radar. For 25 minutes, the jet raced out across Lake Superior. At 6.47 p.m., Lieutenant Moncla was advised by ground control to descend from his cruising height of 30,000 feet down to 7,000 to begin the interception. As the cloud layer topped out between 4 and 7,000 feet, the two lieutenants would have been dropping out of the clear night sky to just above the cloud tops. At about 6.52, ground control advised them to turn to a heading of 20 degrees and indicated that the unknown aircraft would now be almost directly ahead at 11 o'clock, 10 miles away. Lieutenant Monkla responded in the affirmative. And this is where things get very strange. Ground control gave Lieutenant Monkla another clock and range report, along with the information that the bogey should now be passing through their line of sight from port to starboard. No response came. At the ground control station, the radar operator watched as the two blips grew closer and closer on the screen until finally they seemed to merge together into one. Then, the jet's radio signature disappeared while the unknown crafts continued on its way, seemingly uninterrupted. Gene Moncla, Robert Wilson, and their jet were never seen again. Mysterious, right? Well, maybe not. I mean, it says right here on Wikipedia. The United States Air Force reported that Monco had crashed and that the object of the intercept was actually a Royal Canadian Air Force aircraft. According to the report, the pilot of the Canadian aircraft was later contacted and stated that he did not see the intercepting plane and did not know that he was a subject of an interception. Kind of a downer, right? I mean, I found the official accident report and it says it right here. You can read the paragraph for yourself. But if you're like me and you're reading this paragraph right now, then you'll probably end up with the same question I did, which is, 
if the Canadian pilot didn't know he was being intercepted and he never saw the F-89, then how did the U.S. ever find out about it? Well, the report answers that too, in this section that is the statement by Lieutenant Stewart, who apparently was at the radar station during the incident. It says right here in the first paragraph, when A-27T, that's the unknown aircraft, was picked up, it was believed to be VC-912, that's a Canadian plane. But because the aircraft was off the flight plan course by about 30 miles, it was classified as unknown. So it turns out the unknown aircraft was never really unknown at all. And what must have happened was that Lieutenant Moncla and Lieutenant Wilson went out to check on a plane that was just a little bit off course and approached it, got pretty close, but not close enough for the pilot to see them, and just crashed. According to this analysis of the incident I found by a guy named Brad Sparks, the two radar blips merging on the screen only means that the aircraft were about three to four miles apart, given the radar resolution and the width of the radar beam. So it's definitely possible that the Canadian pilot could have just not seen the other plane. And that is pretty much the United States Air Force's official version of events, according to the accident report. As supporting evidence, all the newspapers that reported on the incident actually mentioned how unsafe these planes were, and actually that an identical model of plane to the one that Lieutenant Moncla had been flying had crashed just the week before, killing its two occupants. After researching the case for a few weeks, I would have to say that this is probably pretty close to the most likely version of events, but there are still a few pieces of evidence that don't make sense with this theory. The first comes from a full investigation report done by a guy named Gord Heath, which is very detailed and interesting, and I will definitely link to below. According to Gord, he was able to find the last name of the pilot flying the Canadian plane by making an access for information request to the Canadian government. And the name he got was Fosberg. So he mailed a letter to every Fosberg living in Canada. And he got a reply from a man named Gerald Fosberg who lives in Ontario. You can read the full reply in the investigation report, but the point is, Gord says that Gerald Fosberg told him there was no possibility that his plane could have been off course by 30 miles. Apparently because of the radio navigation system he used, he would be very aware if his plane had veered that far off the flight plan. So that's strike one, and it pretty much comes down to a he said, she said, or a he said, they said situation. The second problem actually comes from the accident report itself, from a statement by Lieutenant William Mingenbach, who flew out to try to locate the plane after it was first reported missing. Right near the end of the first paragraph of his statement, he says, At about 1935, that's almost 45 minutes after contact was lost, heading 330, altitude 25,000, my radar operator and I both believe we heard a short transmission from Avenger Red, that's Lieutenant Mokla recognizable as his voice for about five seconds on channel 10. He seemed to be in the middle of a sentence when his transmission broke through, and therefore meeting was unintelligible. We called him back several times and received no reply. So, yeah, there's the details. After looking into all this stuff, all I really have is more questions. My best guess would be that Gerald Fosberg was right and he was not off course, but the Air Force had to make that up because they were using his plane as a pretext to do a mock intercept trading mission or something like that. Then as they got close to the Canadian plane, I guess their plane just broke down. But if what Lieutenant Mingenbach said was correct, they must have kept flying for at least 45 minutes and then... Uh, yeah, I don't know. If you'd like to look into it yourself, I'll link everything down below. Please let me know what you come up with. But until then, this incident will just have to remain 
a mystery. <laughs>